Alrighty, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming back to another episode. And I want to introduce my guest today. He was the winner of Survivor Season Gabon, Bob Crowley. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing well, thank you. Thank you for having me on. I remember when your season first came out. I think that was 08, yeah. wasn't it? Yes. Yep. Wow. Uh, and no, it's um, well, a, fun, a funny thing has happened um, since 08, and that is um, 2020 and 2021 with the COVID. There are so many people going back and, and watching Survivor, or people that have hadn't watched it but started to and then went back and started watching all the seasons so um i'm running into people which is really i think so, sort of funny that they've just watched the show and it's they're as excited about it as when i was on the show 12 years ago um when they you know like we just had I run a Europe rental, my, well, my daughter runs it um, across the street um, on the 100 acres of land. And uh, right after Survivor, I was used to people in the airports recognizing me and getting very excited. But uh, this past winter, I had a girl get all excited when I went to the Europe. And she was, oh, my gosh, Bob, Survivor Bob, Survivor Bob. And I looked at her, I said, you're 10 years old. You weren't born until four years after I was on the show. <laughs> she goes, no, my mother just got it. I've watched it three times. Why did you vote out Crystal? And I'm like, oh, did I vote out Crystal? Could you give me a brief on that? So it's it's interesting to see this resurgence of people watching the show. All yeah, the shows, a, right up. You know, they stop. They you know, they'll, they'll see, but they, they'll they'll see the last like the last season, and or, or they'll start seeing it. And then they go back and start watching all the season. You know, sort of. Uh, binge watch everything it's quite the interesting dynamic because i would say when uh, your season was first premiering social media was not yet quite finding its footing i would say like maybe facebook had just started to kind of rear its head a little bit but uh there were not the means of right. social media as there are now streaming services weren't a thing so fans weren't able to go back and rewatch like all those seasons at the snap of a finger like they are now or to have access to the cast members like they are now. So we're seeing like now kind of an unprecedented time that uh, reality TV and Survivor in general are just in. And um, fans are kind of like, you know, really heavily invested in this stuff. I joke all the time. It's like uh, the fans kind of swear they were there with you guys. Well, they really, you know, they, it's really funny. They know, some of them feel like they know me uh, <laughs> better than I know myself because they, they do get invested in it. Um, and they, you know, they, they, they have some fans that are just so involved in the show. It's um, really, it's really interesting. What, what kind of dynamic is it for you when, uh, let's just say, you run into a fan uh, unexpectedly in public? Is it like a little bit of a weird feeling, or are you open to the process? <laughs> oh, several years ago, right after we, uh, I was on the show, like two or three years afterwards, we were out in California going to one of the finales, and uh, we'd been there a week, and my daughter turned to Peggy and said, Hey, hey Mom. Nobody's recognized Dad in the last two days. Let's go back to Maine where he get a little more attention. Um, no, I uh, I I get excited when I meet um, like Mike from the last season just came out to visit, and um, we were having a reunion of the uh, fundraiser uh, Survivor game that we played here, and um, like I'm excited to see Mike. You know, I've watched him on the show. I like the way he played. Uh, we banted back and forth on Facebook um, because uh, I was <laughs> I was nervous about him winning because he's like three months older than I was when I was on the show. Um, and a couple of things. One is we were able to do that during the show. We were able to, while it was playing, we were able to banter on Facebook. When I was on the sh show, was it 12 years ago, 14 years ago? Um, we weren't allowed to even be seen in public with other people or on the, on the show, and uh, you know, while the show was airing, uh, we weren't allowed to do any of this, this Facebook stuff at all. Uh, if, 
if you just made a like if I if if I posted a picture of myself with Charlie, um, I would immediately get a phone call, not something on on Facebook. I immediately get a phone call saying, you know, you signed a contract. You're not supposed to be discussing it with him. You're not supposed to be with, be with him, um, and that has completely changed because I think Facebook has realized that all these uh, uh, face. Yeah, I mean, survivors realize that Facebook and Twitter and all that promotes the show dramatically. Yeah, it, it's it's quite uh, taken on an, a form that um, back when you were on your show, I don't think uh, they were necessarily anticipating. None of us, none of us anticipated that, um, you know, what, it, it's funny, I still, I still have the same picture on my, uh, um, uh, my, my Twitter account that I, I took a, uh, you know, a self portrait of myself in the library at Gorham High School. And uh, this fellow was telling, you know, just starting, you know, saying, you know, there's this thing called Twitter and you can only have 140 characters or at the time it was only like 90 characters. And, you know, it was sort of a weird thing that came up and now, you know, it is, it is exploded into what it is today. And then all the other, um, TikTok and um, all the other things that have, have jumped in into the market. Mm -hmm. So what is like a typical day for you like now that, uh, you know, you, you won Survivor, obviously, you know, you head back to Maine. What is like a typical day for you like these days? Uh, there is no typical day. Um, yesterday, um, I got a, a message uh, from my daughter that said there's a survivor, a family of survivor fans at um, Hideaway Europe. And she asked me to go over and say hello. And so I was moving firewood. We have to provide 40 cords of hot firewood for the Europe's and the we've got 12, 12 wood stoves that are going here in the farm and over at the Europe's and at the cabin. And so I was moving some firewood and, and prepping some other. Um, and then I was moving water over for the yurts. Um, went and talked to the family for an hour or so. Um, then came back here. My son was going someplace, so I had to go take care of the horses and lock the chickens up. Um, that's, that was yesterday and today, same sort of thing. But uh, on Monday, Jimmy T from uh, Survivor Nicaragua, who's become a really good friend, is meeting me at Dolphin Marina at 9 o'clock in um, South Hopswell. And we're going to get in the lobster boat with his wife, Laurel, my, uh, my wife, Peggy. And we'll go a couple miles across the bay over to the island that I um, spent summers on as a kid. And now my kids and my grandkids spend the summers out there and we lobster. And so um, I'll have my stern man, uh, Janimal, will join us and we'll all go to the island. We'll drop the, the, the women off on the island and spend half a day hauling lobster traps um, and then come back and work on the camp at the island. It needs a lot of repair because we sort of um, neglected it while we were building a Europe business and working here on the farm, try to get the chores in the farm done. It's just a, it is truly a gentleman's farm. We just have um, a couple of mini horses and a bunch of chickens and dogs. And, um, but there's always, I'm always either on a tractor with a chainsaw, with a wood splitter, um, or talking to um, guests. Um, and so I really don't have a, a typical day. Hmm. Did you uh, use like any of your maybe winnings to like invest towards your farm at all, or? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, as a matter of fact, um, it's we we owned the hundred acres before I was on Survivor, but it was just forest, and so we mm. we put in oh, over a mile of roads, um, two two miles, you know, more than that, probably four miles of trails. Um, and so 
and then we the, this 12 acre farm uh, which was originally owned by a brain surgeon uh, who had 20 horses um, we were able to purchase this farm uh, and then use the um, the other survivor money to invest in the uh, the building the yurt business which we have four yurts um, on this hundred acres uh, and it took quite a bit of um, effort to to build the roads and what these we had to cut the trees down pull the stumps build the roads and then we also for five years we had a uh the Durham warriors survivor challenge here so we took uh, a couple of acres and built a pond and built a field to do competitions in and we played survivor here for uh five years and it's since uh moved to make them illinois um, and uh, it's they're still doing the fundraiser there and playing um, a very realistic survivor game. Uh, we usually had six survivors come and play, and 18 survivor fans play. And we played a game that um, Troyzan uh, said to us after he finished the game when he played with us he said that our game was actually more difficult than survivor because it's only wow. it only covered four days uh and make them they're doing they, they call it the survival challenge and it's really worth taking a look at it's um it's a uh, they do an amazing job of recreating survivor so that people get a real good feeling of what it's like sounds like that's like kind of like you took a good situation to come out of like winning real survivor and almost like turning into like a community, like family type of, uh, bonding experience. So that way, like not only you and your family could experience, but then like outsiders get to get a little bit of a closer look as to like what really goes on in the minds of survivors and what they experience on the show. You nailed it. That's exactly that's exactly what's happened. I, in my wildest dreams, when we we thought of doing this fundraiser, what had happened? I was at a fundraiser in um, Celebration, Florida, for um, uh, Hearts of Reality, which is connected to Make a Wish, and um, I was saying to a fellow named uh, Steve Pickett that, um, geez, I raised money all around the country for you know Hearts of Reality. Um, breast cancer out in California with uh, uh, Jillian from my season does a, a great fundraiser out there and we were doing Habitat for Humanity in Kansas and I said to Steve she said, I'd like to do something in Maine not to be narcissistic but you know I'd like to do something that so I can raise money for um, a cause in Maine and he goes geez I have a friend that wants to do a survivor challenge and he's looking to buy like a hundred acres in North Carolina or somewhere. I said, geez, I got a hundred acres in Maine. And he connected me with John Vitea and the two of them, um, along with, I would say 50 to a hundred other volunteers have worked pretty much continuously now for excluding the two years of, uh, COVID, uh, pretty much continuously on developing this, um, uh, um, fundraiser and it has turned into an amazing uh, e example of what survivors like and it, they they go through the whole thing uh, right right from the beginning they the uh, my son applied and was on it two years ago and the application pro process is just like survivor the interviews uh, just like survivor um, then they also they they keep the contestants uh, separated so they don't know each other until the game starts um, and it's it just um, they do a, an amazing job of recreating it and the bonding which I never would have in my wildest dreams um, uh, realized uh, Kathy Sleckman who was on fans and favorites um, she was the one who's going to cut her finger off uh, she, she wanted um, she wanted to uh, quit the show but she didn't want to quit she was just going to cut her finger off so that she'd have a medical reason for leaving she came and played our game six years ago and 
the, the tribe that she was on are just a bunch of crazy wackos, and they get together every year. They're always on uh, Facebook talking with each other. They bonded so tightly in four days. that They're actually tighter than I am with some of my, my fellow cast members. Wow. So then I'm curious now, what was maybe your process then like with uh, getting on to Gabon? Like, did you seek it out or were you seeked out? And if so, uh, where, where do the lines kind of blur there in terms of the process itself? Um, my, my, I, have, I have a funny story. Um, I, I, I was sitting in a smelt shack in Bodenham, Maine. Uh, and you probably don't know what a smelt shack is, but in Maine we catch these fish that are eight to ten inches long that are real tasty, and we do it in the winter time. In February we cut a hole in the ice and put a tin shack over the hole with a little wood stove. And a friend of mine that wanted to do something in February, and we he, he's a great hunter and fisherman, um, and I suggest that we go smelt fishing. And he's a huge Survivor fan. He's a He's got a bunch of adjectives. He's a retired Filipino Canadian gynecologist, and he's never missed the show. And we were sitting in a smelt shack, and he had a, he, he asked me if I wanted a little nip, and he poured this clear liquid into a shot glass. We belted it down, and I said, "Wow, this must be high-end vodka." I, uh, uh, I drink five o'clock. He goes, "No, it's moonshine. I just got back from Kentucky," and I uh, said, "Huh." So I'm sitting there drinking moonshine, not catching many fish. My cell phone went off. And this voice said, hello, this is Jesse Belladoff. I'm a recruiter for the TV show Survivor. Would you be interested in being on the show? And I said, I don't even like the show. It's an honest person ever won. He said, I'll get back to you on that. I said, well, what do I have to do? He said, you have to fill out a 17-page application, which I'll send you right now. Do a three-minute video. And I said, well, how many people are applying? And he said, somewhere between... 10 and 50,000. <laughs> and I laughed at him and I said, hey, listen, pal, I'll buy a magazine from Publishers Clearinghouse. They give $10 million. My odds of winning that are better than winning Survivor. And he said, well, you're on a short list because we're recruiting you. And about that time, I realized I was sitting in a smelt shack in Bodenham, Maine with a retired Filipino Canadian gynecologist and Survivor was on the phone with me. And I realized that it wasn't, I just figured it was some friend of mine pulling a practical joke. So I filled out the application, sent it in, found myself on a plane um, about, uh, that was February, April 1st. I was on a plane flying to California, flew out there, and the interviews were seven days long, and probably in one of the 157 pages of contract that I signed is something that says I'm not supposed to say this, but I'm old and I've forgotten what I'm supposed to say and not, but the um, they we stayed at this undisclosed hotel. We didn't know where we were. I had a I was given a fake name. They called me Brian Cooper, and I'm sure that's because the initials were BC and would help me remember it. And there were 90 people in the hotel that you could tell who was who was an application you know sending an application who wasn't because. We weren't allowed to talk to anybody. When we went to the restaurant, we had to sit at the table alone. And you'd, I had brought, brought my notepad with me, and I was taking notes. I, I could, you could tell who was who were uh, other people uh, in the application process. And I saw Charlie there. I saw Charlie. I saw Randy. As a matter of fact, Randy thought I w had figured out I was from Boston because he heard me say something, and he also saw my watch and knew that I. I hadn't changed it from East Coast time. Um, and so we had an interview for, oh, it would have been a week long, but on the fifth day, I went into an interview and a bunch of kids there between 25 and 35, an old man about my age. They started asking me questions. I was trying to be quick and funny. And the old man asked me, how are you at lying and being deceitful? I said, I'm really good at that. I'm a high school teacher. I've taught my students to get ahead in life today. You've got to be deceitful all the time and lie whenever it's necessary. And he looked at me, Do you being serious? And I said, no. I, I'm a politician. I could do that. But I can't go on national TV as a teacher and lie and be deceitful. If you want me to do that, you might as well end the, end, end the interview right now. And he turned over to Erica. I didn't realize I was talking to the head producer, Doug McCallie. And he 
looked over at Erica and, and signaled her. She came, grabbed me by the elbow and took me out of the room and said, you're supposed to take your psych interview tomorrow and your physical on Wednesday, right? I said, yeah. She said, give me a ticket. They gave me a ticket and sent me home. And I didn't realize until two years later what had happened. Um, because what happened was, two years later, Peggy and I were watching the show that Jimmy Johnson was on, uh, the Dallas Cowboy coach, and Jimmy T, my close friend now, um, and Jimmy Johnson to get voted off. And they were interviewing him, and he's saying, oh, I love Survivor. I've been a fan forever. I was supposed to be in Survivor Gabon, but I had a heart problem. Two weeks before the show started, they pulled me from the cast. And Peggy and I looked at each other, and it's like it all came together. Because two weeks before I flew out, I get a call, and the girl says, hi, this is Erica from Survivor. Are you still interested in being on the show? And I said, wait a minute. Hey, Peggy, and Survivor again. Peggy says I can go on. So I was Jimmy Johnson's replacement, secondhand rose, last minute. I just slipped into him there. And, wow. Uh, talk about a, a whole series of lucky situations. Uh, and the reason why I the original guy called me is, you can't see it, but behind me there's a four pictures on the wall of the island that uh, I grew up on yeah, as a kid that we're going out to Monday. Um, I, I built a house on the island on a bet you could build a house for nothing. And um, I built the house, collected a bunch of stuff, built the house, then a wharf, and we got zip lines, and uh, built a sauna, and dug a pond, and built a zip line out of the sauna, out of the pond. And uh, so I eventually got a job working as a handler for Survivor. Uh, saw all of that, and that's, that's the guy that threw my name into the mix. And apparently, wow. he got five. But he was a handle of his survivor at that time. Apparently, they get five hundred bucks if they recruit somebody. So that's my story about how I got on Survivor. It does kind of seem like a good chunk of your fellow cast members from Gabon were all recruits. I don't know if you guys have talked uh, about that yes. amongst each other, but it does seem like that, right? <laughs> <laughs> Maddie was walking on the beach, apparently. No, no, Maddie went on the beach. Maddie was at a grocery store, and Lynn Spillman saw him and said, "Hey, you know, you ought to you ought to apply to be on Survivor." Um, and I, I'm sure that um, Corinne and Sugar both um, sort of had sort of. Somebody recruited them. Um, I know that uh, Susie in my season um, actually was recruited for, not recruited, she applied for an earlier season and then at the last minute decided not to go. And But Survivor let her sort of pick another season. And she picked Gabon and uh, she was on with us. So I'm, I just can't wrap my head around the fact that if ten to 50,000 people are applying to be on the show, they can't find another skinny, ugly old man like me among those applications. What I think, uh, you know, it, just here's what I think, because if you replace Jimmy Johnson, they typically like kind of storyboard like archetypes of like cast members and what they want to fill like certain spots. And to me, in this instance, it kind of seems like they maybe wanted like an older sort of like person in a power position. Like, because Jimmy's a coach, you're a teacher. It kind of goes a little hand in hand. I think that maybe that was uh, what they were typecasting there. I, I, th I think back in during my day, um, the old school gang, um, they they did. They had an older an older woman, older you know, older people. They had real young people. They had, they had people that wouldn't get along. You, we all had to take the uh, Michigan Multiple Personal MMPI test, which is a scary test to take. It's a uh, just 570 true and false questions, and they know who we are. I think they have the ability of picking people that won't get along. Um, and that are sort of a cross-section of the United States. 
Um, and they do, I mean, nobody can say they haven't done a great job of creating a show that has lasted for 22 years. Yeah, they took a very simple formula, kept it very original. Um, and I think that's all it really takes. I think a lot of other uh, reality competition shows kind of try to uh, gimmick their sort of shows a little bit. But Survivor does a very good job of uh, keeping it simple. And simple works sometimes. It resonates authentically with the audience. So I, I, I really think they put, I mean, it, when I was out there, there were 90 of us there. It was the third week. They flew 270 people out to California to interview them. I don't know how they go through the decision process, but I really think if they walked into the Portland jet port and just took the first 18 people out of line and, and said, you want to be on Survivor, the same um, sort of quality of people. Because, they, I mean, you know, people in my school, season it had never camped out there you know they had they hadn't watched survivor i mean i in was on um and so i was by no means an aficionado of the show and then there were people like Charlie that had never missed a season and and brandy who was huge aficionado of the show and as was um susie um yeah but um look at me you know, I, I never watched the show really till I was on, and um, you never know who can who can do well and who may not. Yeah. What was it maybe like once you came off the show? You were obviously a physics teacher prior to going on, and um, it does seem like in some regards, like returning to Maine, you were almost like the next coming of, like, God going back to Maine after winning that show. Is this true? Um, it was, uh, it was, you know, the, uh, yeah, well, the, uh, you know, to begin with, they, you know, I, they filmed during the summer, so they announced the names of the contestants, um, at, you know, the first day of, or the day before the first day of school. So trying to teach school, uh, while the show was playing was an absolute disaster because, um, Back then, thank goodness, the show was show aired on Thursday, but Friday, you know, I'd, I'd come in and the students would have a thousand questions and I'd be pissed at, at uh, Kenny for what he was doing and would be rambling on. on um, and then um, I virtually couldn't, right after the show, I couldn't go any place in Maine without somebody recognizing me and, and uh, wanted to ask questions. I had the picture taken with me. Um, but it was, I just, um, I'm, I'm extremely lucky. I didn't have anybody that, I mean, there are always a bunch of sort of wackos that don't like certain people for no particular reason. But generally, I always had uh, responses. Uh, you, you know, some people like uh, poor Eric, the ice cream scooper, because he gave up his immunity necklace and he's he's such a nice kid he's just a down-to-earth sweet kid well how could you and they, they just really attack him to the point where he had that beautiful long hair the uh he came and played our game a couple of times and uh the second time he came he had so many problems with people sort of accosting him at the airport he cut his hair off and i, I didn't recognize him when he got here uh, but, you know, some people have some real, uh, so, you know, have some real problems. I, everything, I, you know, anything that wasn't positive to me, I didn't give a hoot about. I mean, I'm old enough to say, you know, if you want to get, a, if you want to be upset with me over a reality TV show, pal, you know, take a hike. Um, but there, you know, I, I've seen some really um, sort of nasty stuff that goes on with people that have been on the show. Uh, they, they're the girl that uh, lost to Russell the first time, um, I'm losing her name right now, but I was at the, we were, they had a 10th class reunion sort of for Survivor um, in 2010, and we all went out there, and uh, she was there wearing a white dress, and this, 
this girl started screaming at her, and it, you know, it, was, it was an open bar, and the girl had a glass of red wine. And uh, I'm trying to remember what um, that her name was, but anyway, this this girl was so mad at her, she hauled back and went to throw the the wine on on this poor girl's white dress in the middle of a you know at a middle of a party because wow. she was so upset with her having one survive. Uh, so I have a positive. Um, the one funny thing that I find very entertaining is uh, 47 times as I've kept track of it, um, I've been recognized. And one of them was going out for heroes and villains for the interviews for that. I was in the, uh, I'd flown from Portland to O'Hare Airport and uh, and um, this fellow came up to me and he said, excuse me, sir, I, he was really, really polite, but he said, I'm, you know, I don't want to interrupt you, but my son is a huge fan of yours. Could, could I get your autograph? And I'm usually narcissistic enough, so I carry pictures of myself, and I didn't have any, but he handed me a piece of paper, and I said, well, what's your son's name? And he said, uh, you know, Jack, and so I wrote down, to Jack, thanks for being a fan, Survivor Bob, and I handed it back to him, and he looked, said, who are you? I said, Survivor Bob, Bob Crowley. I was on the TV show Survivor. And he goes, you're not Bill Nye the science guy? <laughs> I said, no. And, he, I, I, and I wasn't wearing a bow tie. A lot of times I'm wearing my bow tie. Um, I, I've got about 47 times I've been mistaken for Bill Nye the science guy, uh, which I find, especially when I have my beard on. Because Bill Nye very rarely has a beard, but, uh, you know, he is tall and skinny and he wears a bow tie and he's incredibly handsome um <laughs> so uh that that i've found sort of funny hey that's pr that's probably not the worst person to be uh mistaken for then right <laughs> <laughs> my, my biggest uh mystery is figuring out how you were able to finagle those fake immunity idols on that show how were you able to do that? Like, how um, hard maybe was that to do? Um, that, see, what happened, I, I told you I didn't watch the show before, but once they, I, you know, they, I was in the application process and they were going to fly me out, they started sending me um, copies of all the shows, which I found really interesting at the time because they were, they were um, CDs with um, handwritten you know, season four, episode one, and it sent me a copy. I would uh, watch it and send it back. Um, what was the question I was answering? Uh, having to do with the application process. I'm getting old, so if I you gotta oh, pay attention uh, to what I'm I, saying. I was, when I forget, you can remind uh, uh, me. Um, I was I was asking how you were able to uh, make those uh, fake immunity idols on the show. Oh, the fake fake immunity idols. Well, I I, I watched the season where Ozzy took the stick and cut a couple, you know, cut a little face in it. And um, I, again, I can't remember who found it, but it must have been Liza. I mean, uh, oh, um, who's the girl with the big eyes? And it, you know, but it the the episode showed. The guy said, I found an idol. And she goes, that's not an idol, that's an effing stick. And um, I uh, I thought, huh, I, that's a good idea. I'll have to, I can do better than that. And so I uh, I spent the whole time when I was on Survivor collecting any any sort of trinkets that uh, fell here or fell there. And then while I was at XL Island, and a lot of people don't realize that on our season, we were at XL Island, we were there for three days. Um, and so I was always looking for, I've always collected um, Indian artifacts here in Maine. And when I was in Africa, whenever I, very often you'd see me, I'd climb up on the tall hills and that's where uh, Stone Age man would sit there and make arrowheads. And so I, uh, there were no rocks uh, and the part of Gabon we were in, it was just all sand and hard packed uh, sandstone. And, but up on one of the hills, I found um, a couple of artifacts, and they were, um, there was a stone, 
about the size of the medallions that they were the hidden immunity idols. And I was able to find a resin from the mahogany tree um, that was very much like hot glue or wax, um, only it, it, it's, the melting point was about 200 degrees. And uh, I was able to, to melt this wax over the, uh, the stone. And uh, it, um, it just, it was just like hot glue, and I was able to move it around so that um, it was um, the, when I stuck, um, let me grab it out of the museum here. Um, <laughs> so the rock looked like that when I found it, and yeah. I was able to, if I don't, where is it? There. Yeah. I was able to put that face on it. Now, it looked a lot better than that when I put it on originally, but Jeff threw it in the fire, but I can't turn this around, but you see it's about the same size as my second fake immunity idol that I just stole off of. I don't know if you can see this or not. Yeah, it is yeah. Off that necklace. And so um, I'd been planning on, on making a fake immunity idol before I got on the show, just because I figured I could do better than Ozzy and a whole lot better than Yao Men, who act, Yao Men actually made the first one out of a coconut. Um, and uh, he just, he had found it, it was buried in the, at the, at the uh, beginning of a, a cave, and he, he found the idol, and then he, he made, took a coconut, put two eyes and a nose on it, and put uh, two eyes in the bottom for immunity idol. Uh, and buried it. Nobody, nobody found that. But that, those are the. So it's not not an original idea of mine. It's just that I um, have made the best one that'll ever be Executed. on the show. Right. The, and what annoys me now is um, uh, an a, an immunity idol has been degraded to a clamshell with a hole in it. So anything can be a an I you know a, a, a fake idol now. Or real idol. Back in my day, if you made a fake immunity idol, you had to do a good job. And uh, I, I even surprised myself. I didn't think I'd be able to pull it off quite as well as it, I did. But it was so good. I I walked in and, and Randy came right up to me and said, did you find the idol? And I said, I have this. He goes, you got it. And I said, I have this. And that's when he came up with the idea of irritating everybody. I'd give him the, the idol. And um, he would uh, use it, and we could vote out who we wanted to. Um, and I didn't realize until after the show was over that they were going to vote me out that night. Uh, but they got so distracted by, because I told uh, Sugar that I had a fake idol, and she got so excited about making Randy look bad that uh, it completely distracted everybody uh, from voting me out. Because they, they didn't. They weren't worried about Randy because he, had, he at the time he was having some real problems with his feet and uh, he couldn't do any challenges and they knew that I was pretty good at challenges and they wanted to get rid of me at that point but they get distracted by me giving the idol to Randy and they wanted to vote him out and then I went on an immunity tear and they, they couldn't vote me out. So the night that uh, Randy uh, played that fake idol you were supposed to be uh going out then i was uh, that's that's what uh, sugar told me yeah wow We're so I, if i hadn't had, if i hadn't turn played turn. that idol you, you'd you'd be talking to somebody else right now <laughs> <laughs> does randy still have a bone to pick with you over that night randy's that randy's um he he's an aficionado of the show he's a mature adult he um knows that it, it's a game of chess and i legitimately played him uh the one that uh is still um childishly irritated by me is kenny because he thought he was going to be mm -hmm. able to talk me uh, into giving me his idol and he uh, uh and what he did was he overplayed his cards at one point he, i just realized wait a minute this this guy's just going to try to do the same thing to me that I just finished watching the girls do to um, Eric, um, you know, the season before mine, or two seasons before mine. 
Um, so he and he he still ticked because he thought he thought he had the he he thought he had me right where he wanted me, but then he just overplayed his hand and I um, and I wouldn't give him the uh, immunity idol. What happened was I brought him to the gorilla refuge. He and Crystal, um, because I is an expression: keep your friends closer, keep your enemies keep your friends close, but keep your enemies closer. And uh, at the gorilla refuge, I don't think he quite comprehended what the conversation we had. But I was talking to him about, geez, you probably won't need the me to give you the immunity um, necklace like tomorrow at tribal council because it seems to me we had something figured out and I said um, I recently joined the Masons um, and there's a phrase in, in the Masonic um, lodge that says if you need help uh, feel free to ask me and if I feel you're worthy I'll give it to you and so I used that line on Kenny legitimately I said well let's change our deal here rather than me just giving you the idol you know the next time I get it um, why don't we do this if we go to tribal council and you think you need the idol and I think you're worthy I'll give it to you um, and so he thinks that I lied to him which I didn't I just outsmarted him and he's still ticked about it today well you played quite the uh savvy political game i will say on that show <laughs> <laughs> i uh well you know i i taught school for 25 years and all the kids except for you know um jillian and uh, and randy were the the ages of students i've had over the years yeah. you know i mean and so uh if you've dealt dealt with two or three thousand kids um it gives you an idea of what some people are like and how to to handle them. Could you ever see your record of being the oldest winner ever standing the test of time, or do you think, like, over time that it could potentially uh, get surpassed? Uh, it almost got surpassed last season. Mike yeah. was three months older than me, and uh, it was sort of fun because – I was able to during the season while the show was playing, which they never would have let us do in my in my time. Um, I I got on Facebook and he he, he was saying something like said Mike, um, I you're doing a great job. I I love your gameplay. Um, I really you know I really hope for you to win. Except to be honest, I was raised Catholic and I can't lie to you. I hope you break that. I hope something happens. You get bit by a snake. If you win, you're going to steal my record and take my title. And for a month, he and I banted back and forth. And he goes, I'm coming to Maine. And I'm going to take your title. And it was driving me crazy because I thought he was going to do it. And uh, <coughs> but he, uh, and then he did come. And it was, so I, the last thing I think I, I said to him and he, and he kept poking me and saying, I'm going to, I'm coming to get your title. I'm coming to t get your title. And I said, that's all right. I'm making a fake one. I'm going to give it to you and you'll never know. It's not the real one. Um, and then he, uh, but such a, he, that was another example of, you know, he came out here for our, uh, survivor fundraiser reunion and meeting him. He's, he's just the guy that you see on TV. He's a, he's a wonderful, you know, he's going to be a good friend of mine. Uh, and it's it's just um, it's just so interesting to to meet somebody that you've you've watched on the show. And so I understand when people, especially when I got off the show, when, you know what people think when they first see me because I I feel the same way when I see somebody else that's been on the show. You know when Richard Hatch, um, <laughs> you know it wouldn't be it wouldn't surprise me if tomorrow I came back from. Uh, bringing some firewood over to the yurt, so bringing some water over there, getting off the tractor and have Richard sitting in the kitchen making coffee, you know, and complaining that we don't have enough, you know, good cream. We have to do half and half. Um, it's been, it's been, it's been real fun meeting um, all these people and having the privilege of, you know, I had Sandra and Richard and a couple of other players, but Richard and Sandra, 
are incredible strategists. And we were sitting out in front of the house here, had a little bonfire out there after we'd done one of the fundraisers, and to listen to Sandra and to um, Richard discuss their strategies and and their application videos and their application discussions is just um, I would. I, I'm way out of my league when it comes to those guys. Um, and it's it's just been a, a real honor for me to be able to meet so many really clever, interesting, um, unusual wackos, which we all are, that have been on Survivor. Yeah, it, it does seem like there's like that uh, kind of community type feel to the Survivor uh, cast members like once they leave the show, like uh, some other reality shows, like if there's issues on the show or someone's mad about a gameplay move, that'll carry over on social media, like after the show. Whereas, like you know, I feel like the Survivor cast members do a pretty decent job of uh, letting whatever happens on the battlefield stay there. Um, I, I've, f I've found that true. I, I, the season that they call them the Dirty Thirty, season thirty. Boy, they they were. They moved as a group for several years. You know, all the fundraisers that they're all there. They're all hanging out with each other. They're all getting along, and uh, I find that 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 true of uh, of my season. Whenever we we see um, see each other, um, it's it's sort of like old times, yeah. except for Kenny. Kenny is uh, still having issues with me. Uh, mm. What, what what about you though, uh, towards him? Are you fine with him, or are you? Uh... I'm 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 fine with him. He seems to have um, got on this kick about um, trying to uh, attack my reputation, which I mm. I find um, annoying. Uh, but um, I, you know, if that's where he wants to be, he can be that way. I just concentrate on. Um, people like uh, Sugar and uh, Charlie and, and Marcus. I, you know, I, whenever uh, my son has moved out to California um, because he uh, was dating one of the girls that was on Survivor, and uh, he, he now lives out there. So when we go out, uh, we used to visit, you know, Maddie and Sugar. Maddie and Sugar are still out there. Corinne, we used to visit too. <laughs> we couldn't, we still couldn't visit with uh, Corinne. We generally take Corinne and uh, Sugar out to, to supper, but we have to do it on separate occasions because there's still like a couple of little bratty you know, high school kids. What, uh, what do you think about that rivalry and, between them? Is that a... Uh, it was... <laughs> yeah. It, you know, I, I was saying to Peg when it came to the tri last tribal council when Corinne and Sugar went at it, each other, I said, oh, you got to wait for this, you got to wait for this, and they edited it down so it was almost like child's play compared to what actually went on uh, <laughs> at Tribal Council. And I won't repeat some of the stuff that they, and both of them were, um, were saying they both were just about as nasty to each other as you could be. And I, I was disappointed they didn't show all the real juicy stuff. Uh, but they, I, I, I don't know whether anything has changed, but geez, the last time I was out there, they were, they were still, um, they still couldn't be in the same room together. Mm. That's that's got to be like a rock and a hard place type dynamic for you then, because uh, being being uh, friends with the two of them. Yeah, but that's again that no different than when I was a high school teacher and I had two girls mm. in the front front row that hated each other, but like me, and I had to you know sort of keep them from killing each other. Um, which worked most of the time, uh, and so I, you know, I've just I think that being a teacher I think helped me tremendously on the show. My experience of dealing with people for 25 years uh, mm -hmm. before I got on the show. So obviously we know that Gabon ended up being your lone season, but I think like fans always love to know like whether or not there were any other close calls for uh, past winners or cast members. Did you maybe come close to ever appearing on another season? Because I know they had a, a Winners at War season just recently in the past uh, couple of years they had. But were there any uh, 
calls for potentially that or just any season in general after yours? Um, the one that annoyed me the most was Heroes and Villains uh, because mm -hmm. that was right after I won and um, I had some very lucrative contracts that I canceled uh, to go on Heroes and Villains. I had all my shots. They had my passport and a week before I flew out after canceling all the contracts, um, they decided to hand me my passport back and put sugar on. I, I don't know that, but I'm sure they, they put sugar on and Randy on from my season. And um, I, it's obvious that, that uh, they decided to put sugar on instead of me. Uh, but they've called me up six times. And the last time they called me up, I said, what did I say the other five times? They said, you said you were packed and ready to go. I said, listen, when you're packed and ready to have me on the show, call me. But don't call me. Don't call my kids. Don't annoy us. You know that we're, you know, which one of us are ready to go on. And if you want us, call us seriously, but don't annoy me. Uh, because it just, um, because I'd go back in a heartbeat. I'd, go, I'd, I'd, I'd shut this phone down right now, grab a plane, and head wherever they want to. It's just an amazing experience. And even if you get voted out first, you get an all-expense 33-day, I guess I've cut it down to 20-something days now, but you get an all-expense paid vacation. Um, and it's just, I was just excited, you know, after, when I flunked out of the interview. It's just a... Um, just the experience of going through the interview process was I, I felt very pri privileged to have. So I would go back in a heartbeat. Uh, they are not fans of, the producers are not fans of mine. Uh, the fans like me. I have my fan favorite track of the $100,000, which only ended up being 60000 after taxes, um, is what I bought my, 50 horsepower Capota tractor with a backhoe and a front end loader and a Franz God winch. Um, I, uh, I, and so when they had fans versus favorites um, and they put Corinne on instead of me, I called Lynn Spillman up and I said, hey, Lynn, did you not watch my season? Um, I won fan favorite, not Corinne. Now, I realize that Corinne is much better looking than I am, especially if you put us in bathing suits. So I understand you're putting her on, but just be aware that I was the, the favorite in my season, uh, according to the fans. And I do appreciate them voting for me, because now I have this beautiful orange tractor that I drive around moving firewood and water with. And why do you feel like maybe the producers don't like you or aren't a fan of you, rather? Um, I, th I think um, they they didn't like they didn't, I don't I think they didn't recognize my strategy, um, but I had I had a tough strategy. You know, you know as an older person, uh, the best thing to do was do exactly what I did, and that is fly under the radar. Let every you know. Let everybody else chop their heads off, and I'm just sitting there trying to stack the heads in neat little piles and making stuff comfortable around camp and being, you know, um, I'm just a nice kid from Maine, and I tried to be a nice kid, and I the, the, the producers didn't like the fact that during the, you know, the, um, what do they call those interviews where you're just, you're talking just to the camera. I would never say anything nasty about somebody else, um, mm. and they, they, they like, they like that. They like the Russell hands. They like the uh, um, Boston Rob isn't nasty, but he's he's a hoot. Um, to, I had a funny story about him. The first time I met him, now he knows who I am because he's a huge fan of the show. But it was couple of years after I'd been on the show and we were out at one of the finales and uh, which is interesting do you realize I have never been up, been given a ticket to go to the finale I've been to several finales but I always am with somebody else either either as a seat filler or somebody else's plus one survivors <laughs> either year afterwards now I called up and I said okay hey, can I get a ticket to go to the finale oh no we're a little bit full on that right now um, but the, uh, oh, 
And I was doing a story about the finales, wasn't I? Um, oh, Boston Rob. Boston like, Rob. See, yeah. So he's talking to Courtney and JT and the young, the young crew, and I think I'm wicked funny. And I walked up to him and I said, uh, "Excuse me, sir, I'm really bad at names, but aren't you New York Nick?" And he looked at me and he said, "No." <laughs> he turned around and walked off, and that was the only conversation I had with Boston <laughs> Rob for like five years. And then he married Amber and had all the, the girls he's turned into the an, an incredibly wonderful father um, i'm assuming based on the conversations i then started having with him where he just spends all the time talking about his kids and how much how great they are and how much he loves them and he just i can't imagine having a um, a better father than he appears to be have turned out to be and uh they i follow him on facebook and he uh he just seems to be, and he, now he does talk to me. So uh, well, there you go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's usually uh, the case where fans see cast members or survivors like on the show and like come to these conclusions about like who they may be without actually knowing them, due to like maybe an hour at most of condensed footage over like such a long period of time that you guys are actually out there filming stuff. So typically we're not totally seeing like the complete side of a person. And also that environment's a pressure cooker in <coughs> itself. So. Although I've, I've met over geez, uh, probably over 250 people on the show and almost to a person. They are, in person, pretty much the person that you see on the show. Um, it's, you know, you can hide your personality and hide, you know, you know, fake it for a couple of days. But after the fifth day, the, the real you, and the real you is the real you under um, sort of extreme circumstances. You're tired, you're hungry, you know, you're, you know, you've got some... Yahoo that's trying to get you voted off and you you can't get him voted off and uh, it's uh, it's a it's a it can be a stressful game um, although there's a uh, <laughs> this is a best way to describe me on the show or how I, I dealt with it um, I get up one morning and I made a bench which you, you don't realize how uncomfortable it is not to have something just to sit down and I made this bench and this thing to put your feet up on and it was just so nice to have something to sit down on. But one morning the cameraman, which I didn't realize I wasn't supposed to talk to, but I didn't get the memo or I didn't read the memo. The Peter, the cameraman came up to me and he said, Bob, every morning you get up, you get out, you get the fire going, get the water boiling, and then you sit on that bench that you made and you dig you dig your feet into the uh, the ground, and I said, "Geez, Peter, I didn't know, didn't think you noticed that." He goes, "We watch everything you do. What are you doing?" I said, "Peter, I'm getting up in the morning. I get in the fire going, getting the water on. Then I sit in that bench that I made, and I realize this only lasts 39 days. So I dig my heels down in the ground to slow it down because I'm having such a great time here. And uh, of course, I couldn't." Because there was a conversation with the cameraman, they couldn't have that on the show. But I just, I can remember, I'd get up every morning and just think, holy catfish. I'm, I'm, I'm a high school teacher from Maine that um, doesn't even like the show Survivor, and I'm having the time of my life out here. And I think that that may have been one of the reasons I did so well is the, the kids, um, realized at one point that I really wasn't playing the show. I was just having a good time, enjoying myself, uh, living the good life and uh, in Africa without anything to eat. Um, and uh, they, I don't, don't think they realized, A, and I also hid the fact that I was in probably the top physical shape of my life at 57 years old. Because I just, I was still, uh, doing uh, arboriculture and climbing, climbing trees with spikes and ropes, um, you know, literally week, just the week before I left the Survivor. Uh, and I was real cautious about not letting them know how, what great physical shape I was in. And it seemed to work because I made it to the point where 
I went on that immunity tear that they couldn't they couldn't get me out, uh, and then uh, and then Sugar was nice enough to uh, let the fire gods, as she said, uh, make the decision whether it was Maddie or me that would uh, that would uh, end up there. And the interesting thing is, um, the we were going to vote vote Susie out if she didn't win. If anybody won the, the deck of cards, uh, we were going to vote Susie out, and she won. And mm. uh, if we had voted Susie out and it had come down to Sugar, Maddie, and me, uh, Maddie would have won because I, I sort of interviewed everybody on the plane and later on. Um, and so uh, that's just another, that's just how how luck into, enter, enters into the game. I've, I've often said the game, uh, in order to win, it's one-third just plain luck. I mean, just the fact I got on the show. I mean, if Jimmy Johnson hadn't had a heart attack or a heart problem, I wouldn't have been on. It was 30% luck, 30% uh, strategy, and... I would say 30% physical, um, although some people that haven't been real physical have, have won before. Um, I'm thinking of the, the girl that, I'm almost coming up with her name, the girl that beat Russell the first time. Mm -hmm. Well, look at Sandra for crying out loud. <laughs> she, she can barely, Sandra, Peg, is Sandra here? <laughs> I don't want to piss her off. Does she watch your show? Oh, she might. Uh, Sandra, <laughs> she can do anything, and she. But strategy, holy cow! She is just. She is. She's the queen, without a doubt. One of the best strategists that the show's ever seen, along with with Richard. So you think Maddie probably would have been the biggest obstacle standing in your way of uh, winning? Is maybe what you think, or is there any other? potential names that could come to mind that say if they were in that final uh, tribal council with you guys could have potentially been a uh, roadblock? Um, well, Kenny probably would have had a, a good shot. Um, but any of the other people that, you know, Marcus, if, if he hadn't have, uh, he just he, he just made a little screw up there with um, trusting Crystal. Um, but if you know any 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 one of those could have you know just if you just if you just move one card a different direction uh, if I you know at the end of the show if I was up against Marcus I you know Marcus would have taken it hands down I'm sure um, and but you know it's, it's the you know the the people that are on the jury makes such a huge difference um, one of the things I I really didn't like is the jury's allowed to talk to each other while they're at Ponderosa. Um, and when the game was over, Charlie came up to me and said, Hey, Bob, did you orchestrate me getting voted out? I said, no, you're on my, you're part of the onion Alliance. You're part of the, I said, why would you say that? And he goes, well, we're at Ponderosa. Kenny was telling us all that you orchestrated us getting voted out. So what Kenny was doing in Ponderosa was actually um, trying to s spread false information so that he didn't care who won. He just didn't want me to win. Um, mm -hmm. And so he was telling Charlie and uh, I don't know whether he, he probably told Randy the same thing, that um, I had orchestrated uh, them getting voted out, which wasn't true. Um and Randy had to. <laughs> you also missed a great scene at final tribal council when Randy gets up to vote. He turns around and says to uh, Jeff, "They're all effing assholes. Do I have to vote for? Do I have to vote for one of them?" And everything stopped. And Jeff sort of looked around, and, and they there was this little conference. And you know, geez, you know, nobody. I guess nobody thought of that. And then, but the, the rules apparently says that he has to vote for somebody, and so um, I, I should have known that he wouldn't have voted. No way would he vote for either Susie or Sugar, um, and so he had to vote for me. Um, and the last vote, when when Jeff read the votes, 
I we because by the end of the season you know everybody's handwriting, so I knew that it was um, Randy's vote that was going to be the tiebreaker, and, and that was a vote that Jeff pulled out, looked at, it and said, "If this is a vote for sugar, it's a tie." He pulls it out and said, "It's not a vote for sugar," and he stuffs it back in the in the urn. I was almost going to jump up and rip the thing out, <laughs> to read the goddamn thing. Um, so, but it, it, there, there were so many. It's, it's really they could do ten more shows just with my season, with the stuff that they left out or edited. And uh, I did. I did like my season. I liked the way they they edited stuff. They showed people the way they really were. Um, but they there was so much great stuff that I that I saw that they they cut out. Um, that uh, that that just uh, that that one line, Randy turning around and saying to Jeff. We're all effing assholes. Do I have to vote for him? And the look on Jeff's face was, you know, like, oh, oh, and she's, I don't know. <laughs> Your season was the first season I ever watched. It was probably my favorite stretch was your season through uh, Heroes versus Villains. That four season stretch of seven, season seventeen through twenty, was uh, uh -huh. it was like the gift that keeps on giving. They, they were they were good years, I think. I they I. I, I watch it now just because I, I have to. Um, but um, they've, they've now this last couple of seasons, you have to, you have to have a freaking computer or a notepad there to keep notes on how many different things, you know, you, you got an idle and you got an idle eliminator, then you got a double eliminating idle eliminator, maybe except on Tuesdays. And um, I, it, I don't like that. I, I like I like the straightforward, yeah, fake mm -hmm. idol here or there. Or, uh, th those are good years. Definitely. Well, uh, I appreciate you taking the time out to come on uh, my show today, and uh, hope you had a fun time chatting as I did. And um, I wish you the best of luck with everything you got going on. Well, thank you. If you're ever in Maine, you want to come visit Maine Forest Bureau's, um Take a look at our website. The kids did a great job, and thank. Thanks for having me on. Um, this probably somebody will see me in the airport and realize, hey, that's not Bill Nye. That's <laughs> what, what, what's your website Bob, called? I just, I could, uh, so the for the folks watching, they could uh, go and check yeah. it out. Yeah, it, it's called Maine Forest Forest Yurts. Um, and uh, if you just uh, if you just Google that, um, our website comes up. And the kids did a great job, and they, you can see the. The yurts that we have, and we're open year round. You can either come and sweat like hell in August, like the poor people are doing now, or come come when it's twenty below, cross country ski and snowshoes. It's a it's a really it's a really extreme change, and uh, and, and they're great they're great little yurts, and people have fun here. And it, it's been a great business for my me and the family. Mm, love to hear. So that. thank you very much for thanks. Thanks a lot for having me on. You as well for coming on. All right. Have a great rest of your night.